eyes on the spirit, he's watching us too, right? And I think it's uh, you know, really in, uh, important to, to recognize, uh, sometimes we forget that uh, uh, he knows our every hair in our head, which is changing all the time, so it's, it's amazing. Doesn't have to keep his count as near as many for some of us, but uh, but I'm just amazing just when you look at it. Uh, and we love to feed the birds at our house and my kids and just all the different varieties and stuff that you see. And uh, they don't worry about it, do they? They're out there chirping, doing all kinds of stuff, and they don't worry, but we so often do. We've been going through the uh, series on living victoriously during difficult times. And today I'd like to talk about staying the course. It's easy to forget. It reminded me 23 years ago. Uh, Jean and I uh, bought the girls a horse named Astari. Uh, none of us knew anything about horses or what to look for. And we found out, that obviously, that uh, the horse had no training on him. Of course, we couldn't have afforded one that did. It had a club foot, didn't have the confirmation that you need for what uh, so many of them are wanting to do. But there are many tears as they all learn together on how to train the horse and how to ride the horse. Jesse got a different horse, so Starry became Ruthie's. People were saying that she needed to basically give up on the horse, uh, do different things. He couldn't really do much, but uh, we basically referred to him as the little engine that could, because anything you asked him to do, uh, he would go out and jump, and he'd beat horses that were a lot bigger. He was just 14 two or 14, three of rather short horse, but he would jump three foot jumps and do all kinds of stuff. And so she took him to state. She qualified for state. And everybody said there's no way, but she just rode him every day and they really had a bond. They really had a tremendous bond together, which you need with a horse. And uh, she ended up taking third in state. Uh, the two horses, there's no way she could have taken first or second because the, the, those horses were definitely in a class of their own. But the fact that she stayed with it, but what made it even more amazing is the week before, Starry got foxtails in his mouth. You know anything about foxtails, the vet has to pull them out. So it's basically having all the sores in the mouth. Now how many horses are going to take a bit in the mouth for that? But he uh, took the bit, and in fact the trainer, uh, Sherry Guess, who goes all over the United States, is a well-known trainer. Uh, basically had tears in her eyes just talking about how that horse gave 100%. You don't see that. But just the bond. But what would have happened if they had listened to everybody else? You would have quit. You wouldn't have done it. And yet uh, uh, the horse did all kinds of things that nobody, everybody said that the horse couldn't do. But between the two of them, they did it. And so I think it's true for you and I. How many of us are staying the course and how many of us drop out too early? He never finished the course. So let's look at it. First of all, we have some choices. Look over in Joshua chapter 1. And I'm somewhat, you know, I'm not somewhat, I'm very amazed at uh, Joshua. How many of you like to be Joshua? Would you like to try to uh, replace Moses? I mean, you think about it, that's amazing. Uh, obviously, he was certainly a, cho a choice of his people. It's interesting, only Joshua and Caleb were chosen by the tribe and then also chosen by God also. But it's notice in chapter, so Moses has died and they're looking for the replacement and God then selects Joshua. So the first point on staying the course is notice the choices. Notice what he has. In verse, starting in verse 5, No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I have been with Moses, I'll be with you, and I'll not fail you or forsake you. Notice his calling was what? To take Moses' place to lead the people. But notice his choices. Be strong and courageous, which you're going to find him, he's going to be told to be strong and courageous three times in this text. To be strong basically is strength for battle or get a grip. How many of you need to get a grip when God's telling you to do something? 
Notice the courage is the hardened of one's heart. You don't fall apart. How many of you have these great dreams and all of a sudden you're thrust out in the middle of them and you, uh, you fall apart? Uh, you have, uh, it's very easy to be on the sidelines and telling people how to do it, but when you get thrust out there, you know, it's totally strong and uh, courageous. You shall give the people possession of the land which the sword of their fathers to give them. Are the giants in the land? Are the cities walled? How would you like for God to say, you're going to give them this, I'm going to do what? I'm not Moses. All these things. Notice what he's told them to do also, the course. I want to be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law of Moses. My servant commanded you, don't turn from it to the right or to the left, so you may have success wherever you go. Notice, you're not to deviate from the Word of God. Is that not true for you and I today? You know, we'll have success. And again, how do you define success? It's interesting when we get a little further down. But how do you define the success in the Christian life? But notice it says, don't deviate. Do all of it. And notice what he also tells you in verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from my mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Think about meditating on something day and night. I heard this illustrated a number of years ago when a person was speaking. And he said, how many of you remember the little the jumping beans you used to see at the grocery store you could buy? He said, that's kind of what we need to do with the Word of God. He said, he put a jump, uh, one of those jumping beans in a square box. And how long will it jump and hit every side? Eventually, every side of that inside of that box would it hit. What about the Word of God? How many times do we allow it to keep jumping around our life until it hits every single aspect of our life? Or do we have certain things that know <laughs> that closet's closed? That room is closed. God, The Word of God doesn't go there. I remember even talking with people and they said uh, they're doing something in business and they're a Christian. He goes, no, no, that's on Sunday. Business is business. No, no. It's, it's seven days a week. So notice what he's telling. The choices is to be strong, courageous, lead the people, but you must be doing it according to the Word of God. And you think about it, when the Word of God, notice he says, then what's going to happen? The conclusion. You have down there, you'll be prosperous and you'll have success. You're going to achieve what God desires for you. In Joshua's case, he was conquering the land but what does God desire for you and I how many of us have our desires and we want God to bless our desires but how many want us to do what God wants and achieve those but he also has a caution you look at it notice in verse 9 have I not commanded you be strong and courageous he does it again don't tremble tremble be terrified and you stop and think, what's he being asked to do? You're going up against giants, superior weapons, walled cities, and people you're leading. How many of you would be terrified? The second thing he tells you, don't be dismayed. It means don't uh, panic. And you thought, you think about it. How would you like that if you go up to Jericho and God tells you the plan Remember, don't deviate from the right or from the left. All right, guys, we're going to march around the city today. We're going home. Now, how well do you think that goes if you're the leader? One day, okay. On the eighth day, seventh day, rather. All right, today we're going around how many times? And then the walls are going to fall down. Okay, we're going to walk around this and the walls are going to fall down. Right. But he did everything he's told to do. He didn't deviate from the right. Didn't deviate from the left. Did everything. And they conquered the land in five years. And so I think it's interesting. But I want you to look at something else that you have. Notice in Joshua 4 and then in Joshua 5. Joshua 4. And notice in verse 14. Verse 14. 
4.14. On that day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all of Israel, so that they revered him just as they had revered Moses all the days of his life. Okay? Now if that was you, or that was me, how many of this would start going to our head? I think it's important to recognize, okay, so here, they're to really revering him and holding him up. But notice then, when you keep that in context, go to the next chapter, in chapter 5. Notice, starting in verse 13. Now it came about that when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, a man was standing opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, rather I indeed come as the captain of the Lord, of hosts of the Lord. How important is it for Joshua to remember who's the real captain? No matter what job God's given us, we're not the captain. The people may see Joshua as leading, but the real person leading is God. And I think it's important for us to do the same thing. We have choices. God wants us to do things. Following the Word of God, doing all those things. Doing it with courage, don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left, staying true. But God's still the captain. And so I think it's interesting, a good example of that. You think about Daniel chapter 1. What about the Daniel and his three friends? Did the Word of God tell them what they could and could not eat? Did they stay true to the Word of God? But then you get to chapter 3 and there's another trouble. There's the fiery furnace. You get to chapter 6 and the lion's den. There's just one trial after another, but they stayed true. So you think about it just with the choices. Who is your captain? How many of us try to be the captain of our own ship? And it doesn't work well. Or <clears throat> when people say, well, God's my co-pilot. Well, when does the co-pilot take over? It's interesting to ask. What choices are you making? Is it the right choices or the wrong choices? The second thing besides just the choices, look over in 2 Corinthians. What about some courage? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. First of all, you get some circumstances. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You notice in verse 8, following of 2 Corinthians 4. Look at these circumstances. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Hmm. Sounds like where you want to be, isn't it? I think often when we get to passages, we forget just how tough Paul had it, humanly speaking. But notice the reason he does it in verse 10. So death works in us, but life in you. He was going through all this for whose benefit? For the Corinthians' benefit and for the others, wherever he was at. Most of us, when we go through things, we're thinking about who? We're thinking about ourselves. We're not thinking about our family. We're not thinking about believers. And you stop and think, how often were these believers Paul serving? Were they How well were they treating him at times? Corinthians being a good example. But here he has the cause. But notice the courage starting when you jump down to verse 16. Then. Because he's doing all this persecution, he's doing it for them. 16. Therefore, notice the first thing, we don't lose heart. How is it we get pretty discouraged and quit? You notice he doesn't lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. So notice what he does then. He refuses to lose heart, but he's being renewed day by day. How many times do we get discouraged because we're not being renewed day by day? You know, if you only eat once a week, by the seventh day, how weak are you going to be? I think it's important for us to recognize Paul didn't lose heart because he was looking at what was the, the benefits going on in their life. Second one, he was renewing himself inwardly every day. And then notice also in verse 17, it's interesting. From momentary light affliction. You get to chapter 12, how light affliction was he having? I mean, when you get, you know, stoned, 
you know, you also get beaten with rods by the Romans. You then get whipped by the Jews, shipwrecked, and all the rest of this stuff. And he calls it momentary light affliction. For what reason? Because he's living for the line and not for the dot. Okay, yeah, you can do this to me. I may die today. I may die tomorrow. But look what benefit you're having and look at eternity and what I'm going to get in eternity. And so I think it's important for us to look at the courage we face is because we're looking at eternity, not just today. So, but I think it's important. How many of us are being renewed every day by the Word of God? According to Romans 6 and 7, the battle is over the mind. And I think it's important to recognize what we're putting in our minds is what's going to come out. And do I live for the line or the dot or for myself or for others? And it's important. So notice we have choices to make. We're going to follow the Word of God like Joshua. Be courageous. We also have to be have courage like Paul did. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians 10. Let's look at something else. Notice in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. I think it's important to recognize how many of us are trying to fight a spiritual battle with physical means. In fact, I suspect that if I had people list on a piece of paper what are your different uh, things you are told to put on out of Ephesians 6, probably half of us couldn't list it. I'm sure if I talk to Charlie or Larry or any of you other, Brian, you all were in the military, could you pick that gun apart and put it back together? Yeah. Probably. Could you then? Yeah. And I bet some of you could do it even now. Why? Your life depended on it, and you were doing it every day. Why is it? We're also told to put it on its air as tents. I mean, you put on the armor and you never take it off. The enemy is going to shoot at you when you don't have the armor on or when you have an opening. If we don't have it on and, we, and we're in a spiritual battle, we're trying to, most of us are trying to fight a spiritual battle in our human terms. <coughs> and it will not work. And that's why he tells you it's not, it's, we're not doing that, fighting that way. Notice verse 4 For weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. How many of us have the right weapon? sword of the spirit all the rest you have the shield of faith you have to have the shield of faith because it's going to come at you all the time why is this happening why why shield of faith but look at it when you get in Ephesians 6 the divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses and then notice in verse 5 for we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. How many of us are taking every thought captive? Who's in control? And how many of us is our mind wandering off and wandering to places it should not be wandering? And that's where Satan gets control. Most of us aren't, or probably aren't being tempted too much by advertisement on TV. Why is that? With all the ads. Why are most of us not being tempted? Because most of the ads today are not geared towards our age group. It's geared toward the people who have money that they can spend, and therefore it's geared for the younger people. And you look at so many of them, and it's amazing when they show car ads or anything else, it's amazing how they don't tell you a lot of things you need to know if you're going to go look at that car. Seriously. I mean, they don't have it. They just show somebody who's a nice-looking person on there. It's like, if I get the car, do I get them? Of course not. But that's you know, why are they show it. It's just amazing how they have it. And all these different things that you have. Where you have a car that's t- going on terrain, you and I've talked about it. If I had a car like that, there's no way I'd be taking it on that kind of training. I mean, I'm not taking a $50,000 car and tearing it up. It's just amazing. But how many times are we taking captive what we need to be. Gene and I have often come and we used to like and still do on occasion we like to go look at a lot of the new homes you know and have the tour of homes just look at all the different colors. How many of you are really satisfied with your house until you take a tour of homes? 
you know, if this is the house God's provided, shouldn't we be happy with that? You can learn something about colors and all the different things that are going. But so often we can be, that's also why they try to do what with a car. Just test drive. Just do this. Why are they doing that? Because they want you to be unsatisfied. That's why I always, when we take vacation, I always worry when I rent a car. Because <laughs> it's such a nice car, what's going to happen? You know, you'd be tempted to want to get one. So I think it's important. We need to take captive thoughts. Yeah, the car would be nice, but do I want to have to pay this kind of money or do it for this length of time or whatever it might be? So think about it. You have choices to make to stay on course or not. Well, it's going to take courage to do it. And I think we're living in a society where it's going to take a lot more courage to be a Christian in our society. And we're going to have to take captive things. Look over in Colossians chapter 3. I think there's a fourth one. Notice starting in verse 1. Colossians 3, 1. If then you have been raised up with Christ, have we? Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. It's interesting. Words are center of our attention. Is it on Christ? Isn't that what we're told to do in Hebrews chapter 12? Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Usually our eyes are fixed on what? Circumstances. Circumstances or other people. Most of the time. Notice it says there in verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. You die with Christ, your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. You're thinking of the future, your eyes are on Him in eternity, not today. But we so often get our eyes set on other people. You know, you have all the different things and how successful part of why people don't like to go to reunions is because in their mind, if they're not being successful in the eyes of a, their peers, they don't want to hear what? How well everybody else in the class is doing and they're not doing well. well you, know, most, we, you, you know, we say that doesn't occur. It does all the time. We have our eyes set on the wrong things. We need to set our eyes. We need to take center of attention on Christ. Is he going to be happy? If you notice in Galatians 1.12, Paul says what? If I was seeking the approval of men, I wouldn't be a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Who do we care about the most? Our center of attention. Who do we care the most about? Um, so I think it's interesting. What's our center of attention? Also, what do you concentrate on? Philippians 4, what does it tell you there? Paul's in prison. Just turn back a couple of pages. Paul's in prison. He tells you to rejoice in the Lord, which I always find amazing. He's rejoicing in the Lord in prison. But notice in verse 8. Finally, brethren, this is plural. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is a good report, if there's anything excellent, anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. If you're in prison, what you, what's your mind dwelling on? If you're in a bad work situation, what's your mind dwelling on? If you don't get paid what you think you ought to get paid, what's your mind dwelling on? We need to be dwelling. I think it's interesting. What are we concentrating on? You know, you think about it. We're getting something from God that we don't deserve. Salvation, Holy Spirit, all the other things. Why aren't we thinking about what we do have and not what we don't have. But think about it here. You have to have uh, choices you have to make like Joshua. How many of us have a calling? Every believer. Do we need to be courageous? Do we need to be obedient? Do we need to follow the Word of God? How many of us need to have courage when we're doing it? Because you think there's been a lot of people, family and well as friends, meeting good friends, they're going to try to tell you that what you're doing is not is not the best. If you're following the Lord, that's the best. How are you taking captive the thoughts that you have? What about the center of attention? What's the most important thing you're thinking about? Center of attention? Concentrate on it. 
And then look at the last one in Hebrews. We're going to finish early because of the meeting. I want to make sure everybody can get out on time so they can get to their restaurant before they, everybody else does. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4. We are in difficult times. But what are you told to do in verse 16? We have a high priest who knows our weaknesses because he's been here. Notice in 16, Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. Reminder is, does God know what you're, does Christ know what you're going through? He's been through everything just like we have. We're told to make our requests known to Him with confidence. And notice we're there to receive grace and mercy. <coughs> Not that I deserve it, because I don't. I'm going to get grace and mercy. So I think it's important. Uh, it's not like, if you remember the uh, the religious leaders, remember when they came up with Jairus and they wanted him, to, Christ, to heal because he's done so much for the Jewish people? They thought he deserved it, but he recognized he didn't deserve it. And I think it's important for us as well. When we turn to Christ, we recognize we don't deserve it, but he is a gracious God. Do we believe and go to him? So when we're in the middle of this you know, staying put where we're at. Turn to him and ask him for help to get through it. Because there's times it'll be very, very tough. So you think about it. What choice are you going to make? Maybe you haven't made the right choices in the past. That doesn't mean you can't start today. But it will take courage. You will have to take captive thoughts. You know, it can be many times people will not support what you're doing. Make Christ the center of attention. Concentrate on him and Call out to him when you need him. And he'll be there to help us. And he'll be there to help us. And he'll be there to help us. And he'll be there to help us.